All right, good morning class, welcome back. This is lesson 80 and investigation eight today. Lesson 80, page 524. Finding surface areas and volumes of spheres. What is a sphere? A sphere is a fancy name for a ball. I think of a sphere as a three-dimensional version of a circle. Remember from circles, you have a center point and then you have the set of all points containing, uh, containing the set of all points a, a fixed distance from the center. And you can think of that with this string, um, if I can get this to work, the way you could draw a circle is first of all you label a center point and then you have a fixed distance from that center point and you're just describing the set of points, sort of. The set of all the points that are a fixed distance. The distance is the radius, it's the length of this string, so you can imagine uh, a point here on a string just like I drew, that is a circle. I like this bigger one better. So, circle is a two-dimensional deal, two-dimensional round thing. A sphere is a three-dimensional round thing. So, of course, we have various examples of spheres. Our uh, famous basketball here, this basketball is a little, looks a little gnarly, but our question was, and it doesn't work so good in this uh, video format, it works better in class, but the question that I asked was, what is the circumference of a basketball? And it's bigger than what you might think. There's a, another question about a basketball that I'll ask later. But so people guessed um, different ones. I did not hear from everyone, but I guess that's okay. What is the circumference of a basketball? If you look carefully, this is very unscientific here, but we're just gonna circle around. And I don't know if you can read my tape measure, but it's almost 30 inches. So basically 30 inches is the circumference of a basketball. The other question that's maybe a little more surprising is what is the volume of a basketball? In other words, if I was going to fill this with, if, I mean obviously you fill it with air, but if I was going to fill it with something that you could not compress, say water, at least you can't compress it very much, how many uh, what cubic feet are in here? How many cubic inches? Probably cubic inches. So cubic inch is one inch by one inch by one inch, little one inch squares. Imagine putting those in here and how many would go in this basketball. And I would venture a guess to say that most people are going to guess less than what actually goes in. Uh, we will save the answer for the end of class if we get there. But you can think about that. How many square inches go into this basketball? I'd love to hear your responses. Uh, that is a sphere. Of course, we have more spheres. We have these kind of spheres. And what can you do with these? Well, you can do a lot of things. You can play tennis with them. Uh, if you don't happen to be very, very good at tennis, you can juggle them. And if you happen not to be very good at juggling, then you can do something else with them. This is a small sphere, <coughs> but I'm going to do something with this, with this sphere that I'm going to say most of you are unable, incapable of doing. And I'm not recommending you try this at home, so please do not try this at home. And I've not seen anyone else do this, what I'm about to do with a tennis ball, so you're going to see something you've probably never seen before either, but for good reason, really. That's a tennis ball, you can see that. And I happen to be able to take this tennis ball and do this. Now. I don't do it for long because I get kind of claustrophobic with a tennis ball in my mouth. It's hard to swallow. <clears throat> if you happen to want to try this at home, again, I am not recommending, do not try this at home, but if you happen to want to try this at home, a couple, po a couple pointers. Do not try it with a new tennis ball. New tennis balls are really, really fuzzy. Speaking of which, so don't try this with a new one. Also, new ones happen to be really hard and it's better to have a little bit of give in the tennis ball. I would be curious to see if anyone in this class could be able to take the ball and do what I did. Probably you don't want to do it. Again, good reason. Don't do it. It's very bad. It's very unsanitary. It's a good way to get the coronavirus or any other myriad diseases. You could wash it beforehand. If you do wash it, don't wash it with soap because the soap is hard to get out and you will taste the soap. Don't ask me how I know that. But if you happen to want to try it, use an older ball that does not have fuzz on it. Use it a little bit softer, and I challenge you to see if you can 
put it in your mouth and shut your mouth, at least shut your lips to where there's no tennis ball showing. Don't try this at home. Sometimes it's hard to get out. Puh, enough of that. Spears. Here's more spears. These are nice spears that happen to be in this classroom. There's a purple one over there as well. Dodgeball, gator skin, dodgeball. It's kind of a nice round spear. <clears throat> and I don't think I can juggle these, but I'm going to try. No. All right, back to our good old standby basketball here. <clears throat> Uh, a couple terms at the center of the sp sphere is hard to draw and see. Obviously, you cannot because it's inside here. It's just like the center of a circle. The radius of a sphere is just like the radius of a circle. It's a distance from the very center inside here out to the outside edge. Uh, two formulas. You're just going to have to memorize these because they're weird formulas. I would love to do more research on them and find out why they are as they are. Surface area and volume. So surface area first. What is the surface area? How much paint would I need if I want to paint this basketball because it really needs it? It's faded and cracked and lumpy and whatever. So how much paint do I need to paint this basketball? That is the outside surface, surface area. It's a simple formula for a fairly complex thing. Surface area is 4 times pi times radius squared. We know like the area of a circle, pi times radius squared. And I just don't understand how a flat surface like this, pi times radius squared for this area, how that can just go, four of those fits perfectly and exactly. I, I, I don't know. And then the other one is volume. Volume is a little harder, stranger. Volume is 4 thirds pi times radius cubed. So now it's radius in here. Radius times radius times radius times 4 thirds times pi. So for both surface area and pi, I mean, I'm sorry, for both surface area and volume, these are going to be approximations. Remember, we'll never be able to find exactly how much paint is needed. You'll just have to get a little bit extra and then you'll have some left over. The reason is because pi is involved. If pi is involved, you cannot find it exactly. Now, we can get a pretty close, obviously, fairly cl close approximation. So it's simply uh, the two formulas. It's pretty easy. Surface area, pi times radius, uh, 4 times pi times radius squared, and volume, 4 thirds times pi times radius cubed. You would just have to memorize those for later on in life. All right, let's keep moving. <coughs> Next page, calculating volume of the sphere. We did that. Uh, the middle of the page there, hemisphere. So hemisphere is something that we're familiar with in this setting. We live on this, uh, on the Earth, represented by this globe. And we live right there, of course. We are in the northern hemisphere. Here's an equator. You can see that. The northern hemisphere, hemisphere. Hemisphere is half a sphere, the southern hemis hemisphere, you can say it that way, hemisphere. But hemisphere is half of a circle. Now, what happens if you want to get a hemisphere and you don't have one? Well, the answer is you just make one. That is, if you happen to be as stout as I am, you can just make one. So here's a hemisphere, half a sphere. <coughs> And the great circle term is a term that is out here. So again, we could do this with the equator. This is a great circle. The great circle, a great circle is a circle in a sphere that divides the sphere into two hemispheres. In other words, it's exactly in the middle going this way. You couldn't have a great circle up here going around. That wouldn't divide it in half. Great circle. So if you back to hemispheres now, obviously the volume of a hemisphere is half of a whole sphere. That sort of makes sense. You have to find the volume of this whole thing. It's going to be half of this. Surface area is going to be half. So you don't need any more formulas. You just find half of it. Interesting note. <coughs> hemisphere. Now, there was, a, there was a rage back in the day when somebody drove a Dodge truck or a Dodge car and you said, hey, does that thing have a hemi? Now, I'm not suggesting that that means you have half of an engine, but maybe somebody who doesn't like Dodge could go with that. That thing has a hemi. Does that mean it's a half an engine? There's a word that is in the dictionary that I don't think you know the definition of, at least not the definition that I'm thinking of. The word is quaver. <coughs> what is a quaver? Well, a quaver is when your voice goes like this and you're really, really old or you are 
trying to sing, you have a quaver, so to speak. That's not what I'm talking about. Quaver is a British term. It's a term they use in England, so I've heard. I've not actually been there and asked anybody. It's a musical note. It is actually an eighth note, I believe. A quaver is an eighth note. I should just draw one. So there's a quaver. And then you can have a semi-quaver, which is half of an eighth note, which we would call 16. Uh, did I say hemi? Semi-quaver, semi-quaver. Then there's something like a, um, I believe it is a, demi, a hemi-semi-quaver. Hemi-semi-quaver, which is a 32nd note. And then the last one, which we never use, I never use, is a 8th, 16th, 32nd, 64th note, and it is a hemi-demi-semi-quaver, I think is how you say it. Hemi-demi-semi-quaver. I just think that's fascinating. Hemi-demi-semi-quaver, there you have it, hemisphere. Now, interesting is if you go this way, we call this a quarter note. Our friends across the pond call it a crotchet. Is a very funny sounding word. Um, I'm running out of room. Half note, we call a half note. They call a minim. M I N U M, minim. And then um, I messed up. So this is a quarter note. Thank you. It's taken a while. This is a quarter note. It's called a crotchet. Half note is called a minim. And a whole note. It's called a semi-breathe. Now, please don't ask me why. Semi-breathe, minim, crotchet, quaver, semi-quaver, hemi-semi-quaver, hemi-demi-semi-quaver. I like our method. Whole note, half note, quarter note, eighth note, sixteenth note, thirty-second note, sixty-fourth note. Think of a hemi-demi-semi-quaver next time you talk about a hemisphere. Hemisphere, half a note, hemi-demi-semi-quaver, sixty-fourth note, for what it's worth. That is the lesson. <clears throat> Back to our volume question. So, put this back together. How many square inches go in here? Any guesses? You can't tell me your guesses if you do. But I'm gonna guess ye that you guess less than 454, which is what it takes. Approximately 454 square inches goes in here. Now you can check that if you want. And actually on page 526, they check it for us. A regulation men's basketball is about 30 inches in circumference. How many cubic inches of air does it take to inflate it? Now, again, I said of uh, cubic inches of uncompressed air, but you do compress this a little bit, I think, usually when you put it in. Uncompressed air, 454. The way you get that is use this 30 inch circumference to find the radius and then use the formula for the volume. And you can check the math in the book. I'm not going to. I trust it. They say it takes 454. All right, we're going to move on to investigation eight. So open your, or turn your page to 529. Investigation eight, <coughs> finding patterns. Patterns, finding patterns is a valuable problem solving skill, they say. I wish you were here in the classroom, but you're not, so I'm going to do what I can. We talked about patterns, numerical patterns, and we've talked about them some before. We'll talk about them more like this pattern, one, two, three, four, five, what comes next? Well, six, of course, that's a pattern, we recognize the pattern. Two, four, six, eight, ten, and so on. Um, we did one that is the Fibonacci numbers, which we might talk about later in a later lesson if we get there. You start with a zero and a one, and you add these two together to get the next one, so your next one is one, add these two to get the next one. You always add just the last two to get the next one, so this next one is two, next one is three, Next one is 5, next one is 8, 11, and so on. You just keep adding these two and get the next one, 21. Those numbers are great numbers to study, but that is a pattern. It's not apparent what the pattern is, but once you know the pattern, you can find it. So number patterns. This is talking about visual patterns, and they want us to take a triangle, and we're not going to do it because 
you wouldn't do it anyway at home if I told you to, at least I don't think you would. But you could, you could cut out a triangle and an isosceles triangle like this. <coughs> they claim to connect the points 0, 0, 8, and 0, and 4, and 3. So 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 0, and 4, and 3 right there. That's your triangle. And then you do things with that triangle. So first thing to do is to trace it out and then uh, rotate it. And you can see the book, the, the picture's there. The very end of that little windmill looking picture, it says, what is the order of the rotational symmetry in the final pattern? Well, the order is how many times does it coincide with itself, and that is related to the angle. So what is the angle of this figure? The figure looks like this, if we just see it up here, and we're just rotating copies of it. Rotating, rotating, rotating. So you know automatically if you formed the original figure, if you formed the figure by rotation, then it's going to have rotational symmetry. The angle, what is the angle of rotation? The angle of rotational symmetry is how many degrees until it coincides with itself? Well, that's 90, it's pretty easy to see from here to here. 90 degree angle of rotational symmetry, which tells you the order then is four. It connects four times as it goes around a circle. Question number two, does it have any lines of symmetry? And you look at that and say, well, maybe it does. Uh, I wanna put it right through here, but if I rotate that, then these these chains, so that doesn't work. And I say, well, maybe I go through here. The answer is no, it actually does not have any lines of symmetry, this figure as a whole. Now the figure by itself, this triangle, yes, this way, uh, lines of symmetry it did, but once you made a pattern with it by this rotational method, then it does not have lines of symmetry. Uh, there's more, more things we could do, reflect the line, the triangle over the y-axis and draw the resulting pattern that is reflecting it over here, so then you have one up like this, and then it says reflect it over the x-axis, and you have one looking like this, sort of-ish. And does the, does the final pattern have any rotational symmetry? Yes, it does. You can rotate right here, and it'll, it's a 180-degree rotation, so an order of two, the rotational symmetry. Does it have any lines of symmetry? Yes, it does. It actually has two lines, one here and one here, and the reason it does is because you use those lines to form it. You reflected it over the y-axis, you reflect it over the x-axis. Bottom of page 529, translation symmetry is a type of symmetry describing a figure that can be translated along a vector so that the image coincides with the pre-image. A freeze pattern is a pattern that has translational symmetry along a line. Now, whatever that means, let's uh, break it down a little bit. If you take a triangle and you translate it along a vector, we're just going to go straight this way and make a copy. There's our new figure. Now, I, I, I create this figure by translating it. You could also create this figure by reflecting it, just going like this. If it's, if it's an equal, if it's an isosceles triangle, then it doesn't matter if it's this way or this way, it's going to look the same. I'm saying there's a translation pattern, and that is a freeze pattern. You could keep going. And you actually, uh, in the page, you actually have seen freeze patterns before, and they're very, um, very interesting. yourself, research it, and do some uh, studying on freeze patterns. There's seven, seven basic types, and these are the basic types of freeze patterns. First of all is like the translational, just you're just moving it this way. And then a glide reflectional is it, it's like a glide, but then you also reflect it. So this one moved this way and then flipped 180 degrees, or flipped 180 degrees and moved this way. And horizontal mirror, this one, um, vertical mirror, this way. And then there's 180 degree rotational, there's all kinds. But seven basic patterns. You can have them look simple like this. You can have them look more fancy like this. This is these are all freeze patterns. This is one through seven, or this is one through eight. They're not necessarily the same order as these. But and then you also have something more fancy like this. This looks like wallpaper. If you look at wallpaper borders, especially the border, there's it's it's made of freeze patterns. Patterns just repeating patterns of either rotation or reflection. This one, um, these look like they're reflected. Right here would be a line to reflect across. These are a little funny. This is So there's combinations of all these different types of patterns. Freeze pattern. Look them up in your spare time sometime. Now we're going to go back to number patterns, <coughs> geometric patterns. Quickly here. If I have two points, 
Now I ask the question, how many segments can I draw and know that connect these two points? The answer is one. Obviously. If I have three points, how many segments can connect those dots? I think you would, add, you, I think you would answer three. If I have four patterns, or four dots, how many segments connect these? One, two, three, four, five, six. It's getting harder to figure out. One, three, six, and this was with two patterns, and obviously if you have one pattern, the answer is zero, so if you have, I mean, if you have one dot, the answer is zero segments. Three dots is three, four dots is six, five dots, one, two, three, four, five, how many segments? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, three, six, ten. Do we see a pattern there? And if we do, I mean, there should be a pattern because we're going one or two, three, four, five. That's five dots. This is the amount of dots up here. So if I have six dots, how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, we should answer that. Let's move it around a little bit. It doesn't really matter. They're not all perfectly spaced in this case. But six dots. How many segments? It's not really clear. Three, one, three, six, ten. Uh, I don't know. But if you study this pattern a little bit, what is in between zero and one? How many is in between there? Is one. How many is in between one and three? Two. How many is between three and six? Three. How many is between six and ten? Four. That looks like a pattern that we can recognize. One, two, three, four. So I'm going to say between ten and this number is five, which means this number will be fifteen. We're guessing. And let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 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 fifteen. There it is. Fifteen. I like that. Now you're probably skittish because we did want something like this before when we talked about deductive reasoning and we kind of blew that out and said it doesn't work, but that was different. That was relating to circles and dots on a circle and how many segments in between. So this is slightly different, and this one works fine, which is good. Our pattern continues. One, two, three, four, five. So we would say that the next one, seven, is going to have 21 segments in between. The other interesting thing about this pattern, this one, three, six, ten, fifteen, twenty-one, Besides being like this one and two, three in between, it's related, but if I take these numbers, one, two, three, well, let's just do this. If I take, I start with one, and I add all the numbers up here, how many is, the, I'm just going to write the sum of these numbers. The sum is one. If I have one and a two, what is the sum? One plus two equals three. If I have one, two, three, what is the sum? One plus two is three, plus three is six. If I have one, two, three, four, and I'm just adding these numbers together, one plus two plus three plus four equals what? What's going to equal six uh, plus four, which is ten? Here is this pattern: one, three, six, ten, fifteen. One plus two plus three plus four plus five equals fifteen. One plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six equals twenty-one. And you can see how it how it how it does. It each time it takes the sum what you had, and then add the next number, which is what we're doing here, this 1, 2, 3, 4, it's taking the sum of what was before and adding the next number 5. These are called triangular numbers, and they are, um, in the middle of the page, they're 530. The numbers of the series you've just discovered are called triangular numbers. And so, the first eight numbers are 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28, and 36, and it keeps going, keeps going. And the way to do it, you can just take your calculator and say 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 if you're really bored. Now, here's another way to think about it. Uh, the question then would be, so what about 
this is the uh, the first six numbers. So the sum of the first six numbers is 21. I'd like to know, get a formula maybe, um, for the first 30 numbers. Can somebody tell me quickly what the sum of the first 30 numbers would be? Well, not quickly. I could tell you slowly by going 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 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 28 plus 29 plus 30 equals, and then tell you. There is a better way to do it. <coughs> and I, we, we talked about this, I think, before. This is a little bit unrelated, or at least not exactly with the lesson, but I just, I like these numbers, and we're going to look at it a little bit. If, let's say I want to know what the sum of the, of the first 100 numbers are, so numbers 1 through 100, what are they all added together? Now, I could do it. It would take a long time. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6, and check in about an hour from now, and I'll have the answer, plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 12. I'm not going to do that. I'm at 12 and got to 68. I'm also not going to write them all up here, but I'm going to write the beginning numbers and 7, 8, 9, 10, and then it goes on a bunch and gets to 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, am I out of room, 96, 97, 98, 99. And 100. Now, <coughs> if I look at this whole line of numbers, 1 through 100, and I decide that, look, if I take the first one here, this 1, and I add it to the 99, what do I get? I get a 100. If I take the 2 and add it to a 98, if I take the 3 and add it to a 97, if I take the 4 and add it to a 96, if I take the 5 and add it to 95, and 6 and 94, and 7 and 93, and 8 and 92, and 9 and 91, and 10 and 90, I get 100 every time, pairs of 100, all the way down to the middle, which would be 49 and 51, and then there's one little 50 by himself. But 49 plus 51 is 100, and I got there by going this way. So what do I have? I have lots of pairs of 100 that are combined, and then I have this 100 by himself, and then I also have a 50 by himself. And that's a quick way you could do that. So you have the 50 out of here, you're going to have what, 48 pairs, 49 pairs of 100, plus another 100, plus a 50, which is what? 49 pairs of 100 plus this pair is 50 pairs of 100, so 50 times 100, you don't need a calculator for that, it's um, it's 5,000, and to add a 50 is 5,050, so I'm suggesting, I'm saying actually that the sum of the first 100 numbers is 5,050. There's a formula for it, and we would have to do a little more work to connect the dots between what I just did right here and the actual formula. And there's the, the book does it. We're probably just going to skip it for now because we're ready at 28 minutes and you're getting bored of all this. But it's worth studying. And what it does, it actually takes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, and then a second copy of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, all up to 100, and add those two together. And then you divide it by 2. And it, it involves um, 2x equals 1 plus n and 2 plus n plus minus 1, which simplifies to n plus 1. The whole formula comes down to x equals this number, whatever number, um, let's say the fifth, the, like this is the 100th triangular number. That means numbers 1 through 100, the 100th triangular number. So the series started at 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28, 36, and goes on. That's just taking these and counting up. So the fifth triangular number is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. The 100th triangular number is 1 plus 3 plus 3 all up to 100. That equals this. So the formula is this number equals is equal to n, which is what number you're trying to find, n times n plus 1 divided by 2. So let's see if that works. n for this 100 numbers, n is equal to 100. So we're saying that this, and let's do it this way, we are asking does 5050 equal n, n plus 1, n times n plus 1 divided by 2 when n equals 100. So, 100 times 101 divided by 2. Get your
your calculator there and tell me 100 times 101 divided by 2 equals 550. So the question is, does 5050, I mean, does 5050 equal, and yes, 5050 equals 5050. That's how you can proof it that way. Triangular numbers, the sum of the whole numbers. All right, that is it for these two lessons. Your homework from lesson. Um, let's do the homework from an investigation first because we're going to do one problem together, or at least on the board. Your homework for investigation eight, which is where we just were, is A through F. It's all of them, but <clears throat> we'll do E together right now. So look at page 531 in your book, please. Investigation practice letter E. Square numbers are whole numbers that could be the area of a square. These are different than triangular numbers, which I just erased. Square numbers are numbers that could be the area of a square. The series begins 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. 25. And, and you should be able to see that these are perfect squares. So, one is the square of one, four is the square of two, nine is the square of three, 16 is the square of four, 25 is five squared. So, it continues. Six is 36, seven, 49, and so on. You see what the pattern is. So, they're asking write, to write an equation to find the nth square number. Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is the sixth square number right here. Sixth square number is 36. The seventh square number is 49. The eighth square number is 64. It's simply the whatever number, tenth square number is 10 squared. So the formula that you could come up with is x equals n squared. Whatever number, the 100th square number is simply 100 squared. So then, then that leaves you with, invest, uh, with question F to answer on your own. So answer A, B, C, D, and F. A, B, C, D, and F is what I said. We did E together. So that's your homework for investigation. Eight is A through E. All right, for lesson 80, this is your homework. Investigation 80, your homework is one. <laughs> lesson 80. Investigation 80. Lesson 80, your homework is 1, 2, 5, 8, 10, 15. And if you're like some other students in the past, by the, by about the time we get here and I'm starting to write these numbers out, they're starting to think and trying to see patterns in my numbers. 1, 2, 5, 8, 10 is our pattern. Well, you know, look at numbers. That's great to do, but I'll tell you there is no pattern for this. So we're not done yet. 15, 17, 21. That is your homework for lesson 80. Please have that done and ready for Monday. And that is it. We will also be doing a um, test review on Monday. So we'll be looking at taking the next test. And I'm sure you're wondering about the schedule but I will probably post another video before I post this one that will tell you about the schedule so it gets kind of complicated. I'm doing the lesson one first, and then I'm going to do the homework one, and in the homework one, I probably have already told you about the schedule, so I'm confusing myself, basically, is what, it's, what I'm doing. This is your homework. Do this. Investigation 8, um, lesson 80, and investigation 8. Have that done by Monday. Investigation 8, again, is A through F, all of them, but we already did E together. All right, thank you.